In this lesson, we're going to take a look at how to establish mail flow between our uh, Exchange 2013 server and with the internet. So what do we need to make this happen? Well, there are just a handful of different parts that are required to be either created or configured. First of all, you'll need a domain name. So I'm using exchangebootcamp.com. Uh, if you want to establish mail flow between your server and the internet, you will need your own domain name. There's no point in you trying to use exchangebootcamp.com at this point. Um, so I recommend that if you do want to do these lessons, it's, it's worth spending just those few dollars to register your own domain. We also need to create some DNS records. Uh, specifically, we need to create MX records to tell other servers on the internet where to send mail for our domain. We need to make sure that uh, the firewall port is open for SMTP to get through from the internet to our server. And within Exchange itself, we need to configure an accepted domain, which is a domain that the Exchange server will accept mail for. An email address policy, which is one way of allocating uh, email addresses to mailboxes on the server. And also send and receive connectors. So let's have a look at a very uh, simplified example of how the domain name and DNS and also the firewall comes into play when it comes to getting mail from the outside world from the internet to your Exchange 2013 server. So let's say that we have a sender out on the internet who is trying to send a mail to paul.cunningham at exchangebootcamp.com. Their server will do a DNS lookup to the DNS, the public DNS servers for my domain. And basically they're saying, where should I send this mail? Or they're basically doing an MX record lookup uh, for that exchangebootcamp.com domain. The DNS server is going to reply with something uh, similar to what you see on screen there. So in this case, exchangebootcamp.com has an MX record with preference of zero, which is the uh, lowest preference number you can have, or basically means that that's the one that a, uh, if there are multiple MXs, preference zero would be the one that would be tried first. The mail exchange that it says to try and connect to is maila.lockland.com.au. So MX records are always other DNS names, not IP addresses. And then you have to have another DNS record that resolves that name to an IP address. Now you'll notice that my MX of maila.lockland.com.au does not match the namespace exchangebootcamp.com. Well, the MX record can really be any name as long as it resolves to an IP address uh, that the sending server can connect to. So there's no requirement that your MX records actually match the same namespace as the domain that your mailboxes are actually using for their SMTP addresses. So while it is common for MX records to have uh, that direct relationship, it's not at all uncommon uh, for domains to not have that direct relationship. So here's just a few examples. Qantas.com, which is one of uh, Australia's airlines, they use mailcontrol.com uh, servers for their MXs. Microsoft.com, they're using Outlook.com for their MX. And even Yahoo.com is using YahooDNS.net for their MX records. So you can see there that major companies and even companies that host large mail systems such as Yahoo.com, their MX records don't necessarily match the actual namespace of their domain. So once the sending server has uh, resolved that MX record and knows the IP address that it should be connecting to for SMTP, it will make that connection on port TCP 25, and that's where it will hit your firewall. Now your firewall needs to be configured to allow that port and to NAT it through to your Exchange server IP address. So with all of that in place, the SMTP connection will make it to your Exchange server, and the Exchange configuration itself from there takes over. So that's where we need things such as the accepted domain, the email address policy, and the send receive connectors for in and out mail flow. So here is my Exchange server and I've already logged into the Exchange Admin Center. And here on the left hand side, let's go to the mail flow section. Now first of all, we'll look at the accepted domains. Now I've already got exchangebootcamp.com here as an accepted domain. The reason for that is that it's the fully qualified domain name of my Active Directory Forest. So when Exchange is first installed, that same namespace is configured as an accepted domain. 
If you used a different namespace for your Active Directory Forest than what you were planning to use for your SMTP addresses for your mailboxes, or you just wanted to create additional accepted domains so that you could use multiple domain names in your Exchange organization, you can add those extra accepted domains here. Now it is as simple as filling out the name of the domain and then choosing one of the three types. Authoritative domains, those are uh, domains that you are the sole uh, organization responsible for. Internal relay is domains that you may be sharing with another organization. So what that means is that if the uh, email address cannot be resolved locally, it will then be forwarded somewhere else, which you control through a send connector. And external relay domains are those that you are just hosting and are only relaying through to other organizations. You don't actually have any local recipients. So you would simply save that. And now you've added your additional domain. I'll get rid of that one because I don't actually need it. So with the accepted domain configured, that tells Exchange Server that you should accept mail uh, for this namespace. And now we need to look at the email address policies and make sure that our actual mailboxes have email addresses assigned within that namespace. Now you get a default policy that is set up automatically for you when Exchange Server is installed. And all it will do is assign an at exchangebootcamp.com or whatever your name, uh, domain name is, uh, SMTP address to any mailbox, any contact, any distribution group, basically any recipient within your organization. Now without any prefix there, it will just use the alias field of the recipient. So if my alias was Paul, it would be paul at exchangebootcamp.com. If my alias was administrator, it would be administrator at exchangebootcamp.com. So let's demonstrate how that email address policy kicks in by creating a recipient. At the moment I've only got my administrator user here with the mailbox, so I'll create a new one. I use an alias of Paul and I'll choose an existing user from my Active Directory which I've already created. Okay, so now that mailbox has been created. So let's just check and make sure that the uh, the mailbox I've just created is working okay. So I've logged on to my Windows 7 uh, client machine as my Paul Cunningham account. And we'll open Outlook, set up a new profile. You can see that Auto Discover did the job there. So my Paul at exchangebootcamp.com mailbox is all set up and working. So we also need to check the connectors for our Exchange server or our Exchange organization. So back in the mail flow section here, for receiving mail, obviously we need to look at the receive connectors. Exchange server 2013 uh, installs itself with several connectors by default. And basically these are all set up ready to go. The, the server is ready to receive mail from the internet. And the mail will be received by by the default front end connector. And just having a quick look at the properties there, we can see that it will accept mail from anonymous users on port 25 from effectively any IP address, that full range. Which basically means it will accept anonymous email from the internet. Now one more thing I want to quickly show you is how I receive mail to my test lab server even though I don't have a static IP address on my internet connection. This is actually quite simple, I just use one of the uh, many dynamic DNS providers that is available. I use one called noip.com and the way that works is that my ADSL router uh, is configured with my noip.com no uh, user account details and every time my IP address for my ADSL connection changes it simply updates noip.com 
uh, with my new IP address for the DNS record that I've configured there. So I'll just demonstrate that uh, very quickly here. We'll do an NS lookup. And we get back an answer of mailA.lockland.com.au. So let's have a closer look at mailA.lockland.com.au. That's actually an alias for lockland.noip.org. This is my current IP address that my ADSL connection has. So you can use some aliasing like I do there, or you can simply set your MX records to your noip.com or noip.org uh, domain name. Or if you choose a different provider, there are other dynamic DNS providers out there. You can really choose any name you like. Um, for a small fee, they will even host your actual domain name if you happen to have purchased one. And you can integrate that with their dynamic DNS as well. But the point being that you ultimately need to set your MX record for your domain to that name that dynamic DNS is updating for you with your IP address every time it changes. Now I've already configured my firewall to allow SMTP traffic, which is on TCP port 25, and to NAT that through to the IP address of my Exchange server. So now let's see if all of that is set up and working correctly. Now you can use the Microsoft Remote Connectivity Analyzer tool, which is at testconnectivity.microsoft.com, and you can actually do inbound SMTP email tests. Now why this is a little bit more useful than just jumping on some other webmail system and sending a test email, is that this will actually give you a diagnostic report, which can help you troubleshoot if there are any issues along the way. So the email address I'm going to test is paul at exchangebootcamp.com, which is the new mailbox that I created. Just need to fill out this capture here. And we'll perform the test and see how we go. That test was successful, so let's have a look at the actual steps that were performed. First, the MX record was retrieved, and it even tells us here what that was resolved to. Then the MX record was tested, so it made sure that it could resolve the MX record name in DNS, which it did, it returned my IP address. Tested port 25 to see if it was open on the firewall. And we can see there that it hit my Exchange Bootcamp uh, ebcex1.exchangebootcamp.com server, so we know it made it through the firewall and it made an SMTP connection to my Exchange server. Here's some SMTP commands. The test email was delivered successfully and it also checks that we're not an open relay. So you can see that even though the Exchange server comes pre-configured to allow incoming internet email, it isn't actually an open relay, which would be obviously a serious security risk. So let's go back to the mailbox. And we can see here that test email from testexchangeconnectivity.com has arrived in the mailbox. Let's try another test. This time I'll use a Gmail account. And I'll just write an email again to paul at exchangebootcamp.com. So we'll do a test from Gmail and send that off. And there's that test email from exchange server pro at gmail.com. So inbound mail is working fine. So what about if we want to reply to an external sender? If I just hit reply. Will we see that email in that Gmail inbox? Okay, so nothing's happening there. Let's go back to the Exchange server. And in PowerShell, I'll just run the get queue command. 
we can see that there is one message in the unreachable queue. Let's have a little uh, look at a little bit more information about that. So in the unreachable queue is my email that was a reply to that test from Gmail. So why is that stuck in the unreachable queue? Well, it's because we haven't configured any outbound routes or send connectors from our Exchange organization to the internet. So let's jump back over to the Exchange Admin Center. Click on Send Connectors here and you can see that Exchange doesn't come pre-configured with any send connectors at all. I'll create a new one and I'm just going to call it Internet Mail. Choose the type of internet. And we have a choice here how we want to route our outbound mail. Now we can just allow our server to do MX record lookups, just the same way as those incoming servers do, to work out where to send uh, email to external recipients. Or we can choose to route mail through a smart host. Now if you're using your home internet connection, and it has a dynamic IP address, or is basically otherwise just a residential broadband connection, you may run into some problems sending to some mail systems if you use MX record lookups. The reason be that they don't trust SMTP connections coming from residential ISP network blocks, um, usually because they represent spam or malware and those sort of things. Now, I generally don't run into this issue when I'm using, say, for example, Gmail for my testing, but if you'd like your mail to arrive more reliably uh, in other systems, you may want to look at routing your mail through a smart host. Now that would only really be feasible if you have a smart host available, which some ISPs do provide to their customers. If you don't have that option, just use MX Records and just expect that from time to time uh, your outgoing mail will bounce. But since this is just a test system and a training system, um, hopefully that's not too big a deal. Now we need to configure an address space that this send connector uh, will be used for. Now I'm just going to use asterisk, which basically means anything. So we only have one same connector to anywhere on the internet and we just need to choose our exchange server to be the source server for that same connector. Okay, so now we've established a send connector or effectively we've established a route for outgoing mail. Let's have a look at our queue and see if the items are still in there. That looks like it's been retried to the gmail.com domain. So we'll jump back over to our Gmail mailbox and we can see that test email or the reply to the test email has now arrived. So now we've successfully established inbound and outbound mail flow to the test server and it is basically at this point a fully functioning mail server that can be used now to explore all of the other features of Exchange Server 2013.